Our next speaker is Robert Cribb, an emeritus professor in Asian history. He's an expert in the history of war and atrocities. Among his many publications is Japanese War Criminals, The Politics of Justice After the Second World War, and Detention Camps in Asia, The Conditions of Confinement in Modern Asian History. Uh, today, he questions the legacy of Japanese atrocities through a critique of exceptionalism in war crimes. Robert. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for coming along this morning, and thanks very much, Carolyn, for the invitation to, uh, to speak at this uh, third roadshow in the histories and legacies of violence. During the Sino-Japanese War, 1937-45, and the uh, Pacific War, 1941-45, Japanese military personnel committed a great many war crimes against people under their control. Prisoners of war, civilian internees, and uh, inhabitants of occupied territories. The war crimes included massacres, rapes, uh, individual murders, beating, torture, and confinement in harsh conditions. Now, the 20th century was perhaps exceptionally bloody. It was certainly bloody. And it's quite common to place Nazi Germany at the pinnacle of the, the record of, uh, of evil, of, of bloodiness, uh, especially because of the, uh, the Holocaust. Uh, but there is a significant literature, especially on social media, but also in popular writing and to a significant extent in academic writing, that identifies Japanese war crimes as worse than those of the, uh, of the Nazis. So this sense of Japanese exceptionalism is based on a couple of uh, propositions. One is statistical. Uh, it suggests that uh, the, the death toll in China as a consequence of Japanese, uh, the Japanese invasion was enormous, perhaps up to 35 million people. Uh, the problem being that that figure is almost entirely without evidence. The evidence suggests a, uh, a death toll, uh, in, in a civilian death toll in China, uh, somewhere between two and five million, which crucially is very close to the death toll that can be attributed both to the, individually to the Guomindang, the nationalist government, and to the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, it also rests on a, a comparison of death rates amongst uh, prisoners of war in the eastern and western theatres. It's said that 27% of allied prisoners of war of the Japanese died in captivity, whereas only 4% of, uh, uh, western, uh, of, of allied prisoners of war in German hands died. Uh, but this is a, an intensely curated statistic, which on the European side ignores the eastern front, and on the western side, uh, on the western side ignores the uh, eastern front. Sorry, yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean. And on the, on the Asian side ignores the Asian prisoners of war. It ignores the enormously high death rate as a result of friendly fire. Somewhere between one third and two thirds of uh, POW deaths were the consequence of friendly fire. And it ignores the death rate amongst allied soldiers under their own commanders as a result of disease. In fact, you were less likely to die of disease on the Thailand-Burma Railway than you were as an Indian soldier in the British Indian Army in Burma in the early part of the, the war. So those, those statistics are highly curated. The second proposition is that the Japanese were crueler than the Germans. It's quite common to see uh, people comment that, well, the Germans might have been bastards, but they were gentlemen, whereas the, uh, the Japanese were simply uh, savages. Uh, and this, too, is a, a curated uh, uh, perception. Many of the cases which are presented as uh, evidence of exceptional Japanese brutality are, in fact, fictional. Uh, they didn't take take place. For instance, the suggestion that there was an, an order by the Japanese army to kill all the prisoners at the end of the war. It simply didn't exist. Uh, many others, uh, 
were not were not fictionalized, uh, but they have direct parallels, direct equivalents in the behavior of Western and Chinese troops, if not during the Second World War, then in civil wars before and after the, uh, the Second World War, and especially in the wars of colonial suppression, again, before, immediately before and immediately after the, the Second World, uh, World War. Um, horrible medical experiments, killing of prisoners, torture, appalling camp conditions, and trafficking in comfort women are all very much on the Western side of the ledger as they are on the, the Japanese side. Japanese crime, war crimes are, of course, better documented than almost any other 20th century crimes because of the, uh, the post-war, except for the Holocaust, of course, uh, because of the intense investigations that were undertaken after the Second World War in preparation for the more than 2,000 war crimes trials of Japanese that, uh, that took place from 1946 to 1951. And let me emphasize that this record shows that the, uh, that the Japanese military personnel committed a great many uh, uh, war crimes. But it also shows that the vast majority of those war crimes were either the consequence of incompetence or panicked response to challenged, challenging circumstances. Uh, in other words, there are a consequence of Japanese soldiers being out of their, uh, and officers being out of their depth. Uh, or they were a consequence of the ruthless ap application of the doctrine of military necessity, the same ruthless application that led to the dropping of atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. <coughs> there was a small proportion, significant but small, uh, in which the perpetrators were psychopaths, people who took the opportunity provided by the, the war the, the freedom of action in order to indulge their, uh, their individual psychopathy. Uh, but what the record fails to show is that there was anything particularly distinctive about Japanese behavior. It certainly doesn't show that there was any element in Japanese culture which led to unusual levels of, uh, of violence. It fails to show that Western soldiers were any different from Japanese soldiers, particularly in their conduct of uh, colonial wars, in which at the time it was believed the laws of war did not apply. Uh, colonial wars were considered to be exempt from the laws of, uh, of war. So this myth of Japanese exceptionalism has its roots in the intensely racialized conduct of the, uh, of the Pacific War. On both sides, Japanese and uh, Allied side, there was an intense racialization of the, of the conflict, which contrasts strongly with the ideological element in the European war, where the war could be portrayed as a contrast between fascism and democracy, between fascism and, uh, and communism. Those lines existed in the, uh, in the Asian theater, but they were much more subdued in comparison with the simple, simple racial juxtaposition of Japanese versus, uh, versus Westerners. There was enormous indi indignation on the Western side that they were being ill-treated by Japanese, by people whom they had learnt to despise. Uh, POW memoirs, the memoirs of uh, internees, are shot through with uh, indignation over the loss of colonial privilege, privilege, privileges that they had enjoyed in the colonial order in East Asia, semi-colonial order in East Asia, the colonial order in, in Southeast Asia, and almost always a complete blindness to the basis of colonial privilege. They assumed that they were entitled to be there, and the Japanese were not. Uh, many of the, uh, the descriptions, many of the accounts, refer to Europeans, Westerners, being reduced to the level of the natives. Um, and indeed, in a particularly important respect, they were. The, the death rate amongst 
European civilians who are interned by the Japanese in Southeast Asia turns out to be almost the same as the death rate amongst indigenous Southeast Asians in peacetime, in the colonial era. So Europeans were indeed reduced to the level of the, the natives. They were reduced to the level that they had themselves presided over amongst the subject populations of their, uh, of their colonies. So the continuing perception of Japanese exceptionalism, however, is not simply a, a relic of, the, uh, uh, of this wartime antagonism. Uh, it is sustained, I think, by the contemporary value of contemporary usefulness it has for a number of political positions. Uh, put very simply, uh, invoking Japanese war crimes as the worst is used to exonerate all the rest. On social media, it's uh, striking how references to Japanese war crimes have been used to exonerate Nazi war crimes, to suggest that the Nazis were, uh, uh, for all their brutality, might not have been as bad as the, uh, as the Japanese. Very clearly, it's used to exonerate colonial, colonialist violence to say that, well, yes, the colonialists can, uh, carried out some uh, atrocities, but they were nothing like the, uh, the Japanese. And just in the last uh, couple of months, on social media, uh, it's been used to exonerate the war crimes attributed to Ben Robert Smith. Uh, we have seen, perhaps not in mainstream publications, but certainly on, uh, uh, on Twitter, and, in, uh, uh, and on Facebook, people saying, OK, he might have done some bad things, but it was nothing like what the, uh, the Japanese did in the, in the Second World War. At the same time, in East Asian politics, Japanese war crimes are used by the Chinese government to disqualify Japan from participation as an equal in the international affairs of, uh, of East Asia. Uh, you will perhaps recall earlier this year, the, uh, the Chinese ambassador to Australia made a speech in which he said Australia should not engage in a defence cooperation with Japan because of Japan's wartime record. A few years ago, the Chinese foreign minister made exactly the same point. This is a, an attempt to invoke a historical past in order to achieve a political aim in the, in the present. Some of you will be familiar with uh, David Anderson's book, uh, Histories of the Hanged. It's a study of the violence of British repression of Mau Mau insurgency in, uh, in Kenya. In the introduction, he says, we shouldn't be engaged in establishing a, a league table of uh, barbarity. Uh, what he is particularly saying is that we shouldn't in the study of Western colonial atrocities, we shouldn't be exclu excusing one colonial power for not being as bad as another. And those of you who have worked in colonial history will be very familiar with the, uh, the, the comment, well, at least we weren't as bad as the Belgians. Um, so his, his argument is that this exoneration of uh, our own crimes, our own past crimes, uh, by referring to still worst, worse crimes, works counterproductively. It works against our recognition of, uh, uh, of the crimes that were committed. Uh, it's not a call to abandon uh, comparison. In that very same paragraph, he identifies colonial violence as, uh, as exceptional. But it does mean that when we embark on our investigation of past violence, we need to be very careful that what we do in investigating that violence, the violence of some groups in the past, is not working to exonerate other groups. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.